Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics for our semi-annual Global Economic Prospects. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and as usual, we're sort of kicking off our busy season around the IMF World Bank annual meetings with the Global Prospects effort, led once again, I'm very pleased and grateful to say, by Karen Dynan. Uh, just a couple words of intro beyond thank you all for joining me and introducing our three colleagues, our great speakers today. As those of you watching online, and particularly those of you who joined us in person know, the Peterson Institute has been doing this semi-annual forecasting exercise for well over a decade now, um, previously with uh, contributions by Michael Musa and then by David Stockton, and now led by Karen Dynan, who was, of course, Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy and Chief Economist at the U.S. Treasury from 2014 to 17. Um, the point of the exercise is not to pretend we're the IMF or let alone uh, an investment bank. It is instead to take stock uh, in a slightly more disciplined way than we usually do, um, ahead, about a week or so ahead of the IMF releasing the World Economic Outlook each, year, each half year, and try to both have a central forecast of what we think is going to happen to the major economies in the G20, starting with the US, and of course that's where we start with Karen, but also to flag places where we think the consensus or the official sector is missing perhaps a key point. Um, some of this will come out in Karen's overview of the main economies in the global outlook, and that draws on the expertise of her colleagues here at the Peterson Institute on various countries and regions. But it is, in the end, just to be clear, Karen's own forecast, and she gets full credit. I get full blame. Um, we also try each session to have two either regionally specific or thematic presentations by senior fellows who bring out something else. Um, and for those of you in the forecasting business, our record is pretty good, whether it's Nick Lardy warning people not to overestimate the fragility of the Chinese economy, Monica Debola arguing that people should not overestimate the resilience and growth upside of Brazil a couple of years ago, or my urging people not to underestimate the likelihood of Trump and a massive fiscal change in the US. Our record is pretty good, but it's more about trying to stimulate points of understanding. And so in that regard, I'm very fortunate, uh, the Institute is very fortunate to feature two of our newer fellows, but people world renowned and well known to all of you. Uh, speaking after Karen will be Jean Pisani Ferry, who's technically a visiting fellow with us right now, but we hope the start of a renewed relationship. He's the Tommaso Pada Schiappa Chair at the European University Institute in Florence. He, of course, has been a major creative force for economic policy in France, particularly in the, new, the latest government, and very influential in European affairs. Most importantly for us, he was the co-founder of our first cousin in Europe, the Bruegel Think Tank. Um, Jean will be doing a deeper dive on Bruegel, I mean, excuse me, not on Bruegel, thank God, on, on, on Brexit, Brexit, Bruegel, brunch, you know, um, on Brexit, but also on the future pivot, or the coming pivot, I should say, of Europe to more aggressive green stimulus and policies. Um, and obviously, we are very proud at the Peterson Institute of our extensive team working on Europe, I think the best in the US, but we wanted to really get a new perspective in for all of you. Finally, in terms of the overall presentations, we'll have Morris Obsfeld, who's been with the Institute since February 2019, essentially since he left being um, Economic Counselor and Director of Research at the IMF. Maury is, of course, one of the leading international economic economists in the world and has been teaching at the University of California, Berkeley, since 1991. We have released and it is available on the website 
his paper on international effects and constraints on U.S. monetary policy. It's a very comprehensive work. Some of this was already seen in June at the Fed Listens Conference. Maury has gone the extra yard, and for today's uh, presentation is focusing much more directly on the policy impacts, not just the possible avenues of, of channels of transmission on this critical issue of how much the Federal Reserve and by extension, the U.S. economy needs to take into account the low rates and the slowdown in the rest of the world. If I could just offer a couple preview comments before my distinguished colleagues speak. Um, I think it's very important to recap a couple points that everyone should keep in mind when thinking about macro forecasts. And no, these are not uh, excuses about accuracy or anything of that kind. The first is to remember that economics is not a morality play at the macroeconomic level. We saw this repeatedly during the crisis. Many people, myself included, commented on that. And I think that's the case today. There are a lot of policies out there, particularly in the United States, but in many other governments, that we consider very misguided at best, uh, destructive at worst. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a recession immediately. It would be nice in some sort of neat way if that were the case, particularly for the Peterson Institute, to stand up and say protectionist backwards trade policies will immediately mess you up. Um, but we've been very careful not to say that because it's probably not true. What backwards protectionist trade policies and other policies towards the global economy will do is leave you with no investment, which is what we've seen in this recovery despite the tax cuts and deregulation and growth. What it will leave you with is a trend towards lower productivity because of lower competition and lower investment. What it will leave you with is many distortions that are not only economic but political as we're seeing through the process of government handouts and government backdoors occasioned by this policy and it will lead to a more uncertain environment but it will not necessarily lead to a recession. And so we want people to recognize that, as I said in the, in the uh, press release, we may sort of blunder and luck into a soft landing for the US and some of the rest of the world. That doesn't mean every policy was helpful. It just means they were destructive in different ways. The second point I would like to make is that we are thinking about the future where we'll all be spending the rest of our lives. Um, and it's very important to pick up on John's case about the move to green investment and other similar policies regarding decarbonization in Europe as a macro issue. And in coming weeks and months, the Peterson Institute is going to be working hard on this. As a personal interpretation and forecast, I see a lot of fiscal stimulus coming down the pike in Western Europe, in Japan, in other countries, in the UK, whether or not they can afford it. Um, and frankly, perhaps delayed by the election, in the US. And the challenge which we've picked up on since, of course, Olivier Blanchard's challenge to receive wisdom on the limits of debt constraint on fiscal policy is how you don't waste that money how you make best use of it, not just for stopping a recession, but to make the world a better place for the future. And this is going to be about decarbonization. There's going to be a new green deal, new green something. And now the question is, and the possible recession in Germany and elsewhere may give additional burst to this. The question is, how can we make it sustained for sustainability? How can we make it green yet clear? And that's where we're going to be emphasizing our work. Finally, I want to give a shout out to both Karen and Maury, as well as Jean, because they're grappling with this mix, this uh, horrible phrase, fiscal monetary policy coordination, which is all the rage in certain circles and not heard of by anyone else for good reason. But the basic motivating point, as each of our presenters will touch on, is we are coming to a world where maybe the recession is not going to happen this next year, but where likely we will face the next recession with insufficient monetary policy room to offset it. 
Obviously, outgoing ECB President Mario Draghi has made this point very bluntly, as have others. I think what's important to take away as a message that I took from my three colleagues, they will speak for themselves, is that we can fight the next recession through fiscal policy. We probably should fight the next recession through fiscal policy, but it would be good if we tethered it back to both realistic assumptions about what potential growth is in the major economies and, again, the need to not waste the opportunity for decarbonization. I hope that whets your appetite for what are going to be three very exciting presentations. This is, of course, on the record. Our colleagues will each present in order and then take their comments. Let me take your questions and comments. May I please start by calling up my friend Karen Dynan, professor of the practice at Harvard University. Karen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's really nice to be here and have a chance to talk about the economic outlook uh, in these very interesting economic times. Um, let me start you off with just a few thoughts about the big picture. Um, so things have changed a lot from where we were a year, year and a half ago, where we were talking about this synchronized global expansion. Um, the global economy now is experiencing a decided uh, slowdown. And I wouldn't describe it as synchronized either. Different countries are experiencing different degrees of slowdown. Um, there are confluence of forces that are behind this slowdown. I'll come to some of them specifically uh, when I get to the next slide. Uh, but I will note uh, that um, while the risk of recession is higher everywhere, um, growth has only stalled or turned negative in a couple of economies. Okay, so uh, let me dig in on the, the details a bit. Uh, so this is uh, growth rates and projected growth rates for a selected group of countries. Um, the fiscal boom in the United States, uh, that's given way to more moderate growth. I'll talk about the details in a minute. Um, Jean's going to talk uh, in more depth about Europe, but I will say uh, my forecast calls uh, for some for a for a slowing to uh, what's about trend pace for Europe. Uh, there are some weaker spots in Germany and Italy, uh, most notably, uh, but this is really a kind of moderation in growth there as well. Um, we're more upbeat than consensus is about Japan. Yes, tax hikes were uh, put in place at uh, the beginning of, uh, of October. There were consumption tax hikes, but uh, we think the government is going to deliver on some stimulus to offset that. So we've written down what are pretty decent growth rates for Japan. Um, not so upbeat about the UK. Uh, we do think there is a material uh, chance of uh, a no deal Brexit, and John's going to talk more about that. Um, but even the kind of uh, the alternative outcomes to a no deal Brexit are not that great for the economy. Uh, in China, there's been a slowing this year. It's been uh, partly uh, driven by a successful effort of the government to curb credit growth there. Uh, but more generally, we think there's just this ongoing slowing that has to do, that for structural reasons, that has to do with the uh, dominance of, uh, or the ongoing dominance of state-owned enterprises that have low productivity growth in that economy. Um, India, uh, recent data suggests that their risk growth is fading. Uh, my views of India are partly informed um, by my Kennedy School and PIE colleague Arvind Subramanian. I should say that uh, he has recent very provocative work that suggests that maybe the official growth rates in India are overstated. Um, I want to note that um, although we've been talking through economic fundamentals, these growth rates are still on kind of the official basis. Um, I guess I'll just note uh, Brazil uh, is continuing its recovery, but it's continuing to occur at a very uh, slow pace owing to structural factors. 
Okay, so with that said, um, let me dig in a little more on the United States. Uh, so first of all, I read uh, last Friday's uh, employment report as confirming that the U.S. expansion has moderated. What I'm showing you here is um, the dark line is a three-month moving average of payroll growth, and as you can see, it has uh, come down by something like 75,000 uh, relative to the average uh, for 2018. Okay, um, so I chose the word uh, moderated uh, carefully because I don't think the U.S. economy is going to a dark place. I think what we're seeing is U.S. GDP growth basically falling back to its trend level, something a little below 2%, uh, what you might call a soft landing in the United States. Uh, so it's not a, a dark story. Consistent with that, I have the unemployment rate bottoming out at 3.5% uh, this year, heading up just a little bit next year, and inflation creeping slowly back to 2%. Um, I would not describe the U.S. Uh, economic situation, I wouldn't describe it as ideal. So in particular, growth has not been that balanced. It's been strongly consumer-led. And what you can see in this chart is contributions uh, to growth in 2018 and 2019 to date from different important categories of GDP. And if you just look at the light blue bars, which are this year, you can see that growth this year is dominated by consumer spending. Uh, we aren't seeing uh, any contribution really from business investment. That's something that's going to come back to bite our economy uh, over the medium long run as it eats into the capital stock and potential output. Um, I do expect some pickup in business investment next year, uh, but government the contribution of government purchases should fade next year. Um, so this begs the question of how's the consumer doing? Can the consumer continue to sustain growth? And my answer there is I do think that consumers have both the, the wherewithal and the appetite to continue to spend. Um, so I do want to note that I think that real income growth is likely to slow. That's the dark line in this chart. You can see it's already slowing a bit and le lend less support to consumption, I think it will slow um, you know, primarily because of what's going on in labor markets, that we're seeing less payroll growth and we're seeing outputs, uh, sorry, aggregate hours declining. You can see that in the light shaded bars on this chart. Um, and I also think uh, the tariffs will take a small bite out of real income growth. All that said, I think the other drivers of consumption are actually looking pretty good. So uh, this chart shows you on the left um, wealth. And the point I want to make here is, I mean, we know wealth has been rising because of higher stock prices and home price appreciation. It's often said that, well, that's all at the top of the distribution because wealth is so concentrated. I do want to kind of point out, this is um, nice data that's released by the Federal Reserve now on the, the distribution of household wealth. What you can see here is that wealth has been growing across the distribution, even in the bottom 50% of the distribution. Um, sort of consistent with that, we're seeing uh, consumer balance sheets that look strong. Um, so, uh, you know, we've seen low debt growth. Uh, we've seen uh, low levels of delinquency. What I'm showing you on the right is uh, the bankruptcy series, which is also very low right now. Um, in addition, household indicators of household confidence, confidence have held up. So on the right, I have a graph of a traditional indicator of confidence. And you can see we have seen some zigs and zags over time. Uh, it's come a little bit off kind of the high end of its range, but it's still pretty high by historical confidence, or by historical standards, sorry. Um, what I show on the left is uh, what you know if you've seen me present before is one of my favorite indicators of confidence, which is light vehicle sales. Um, they're holding up. I like light vehicle sales because it's a very discretionary category of consumption. It's very timely. It's released only a couple of days after the end of the month, and it's really well measured. So uh, if something pernicious were happening in the economy, the first place I'd expect it to see it, the first place I'd expect to see it would be in car sales. Um, should also note that I think we're seeing some signs of life in the housing sector. So uh, housing construction, which is what I'm showing on the left, and uh, sales have picked up after a lull earlier this year. Uh, likewise, you can see housing market sentiment having picked up on the right side of this picture. I think that's... Um, driven in large part by better affordability. So interest, mortgage interest rates are down uh, 
uh, a bit this year. Uh, housing house price appreciation has slowed this year. Um, I think there is considerable pent up demand with the millennials. If you look at their home ownership rates, you can see that they are lower than uh, previous generations. Uh, you know, for the age that they're at, um, maybe there's some lesser appetite to own homes, but I don't think it's that much lesser. Um, in contrast, uh, not so upbeat about what's going on in the business sector. So this is just a graph of core orders. You can see they are just moving sideways. So does not uh, suggest that we're going to see uh, strong investment growth anytime sooner. And of course, um, can't talk about the business sector without uh, mentioning what's going on uh, in manufacturing. That is a weak spot in the U.S. economy. Uh, what I'm showing here is the darker line is the new orders index from the, uh, the ISM survey. Uh, you can see that it has fallen in, over the past year. It's gone into um, contractionary uh, territory. And if you look at the red line, which is new export orders, you can see it's really been pulled down by uh, what's going on abroad. Um, I guess if you want to have the, so, so, so I will note manufacturing, it's weak. It's a small-ish part of our economy. Manufacturing employment is only about eight and a half percent of total payrolls. Um, and I guess if you want to have a glass half full um, kind of reading of this chart, you could argue, well, the new orders index is, is down. It has not come down as much as it has, uh, as, as it has in other countries. So we look to be in better shape in that regard. And if you look very closely at the graph, you can see that uh, the index was actually flat between August and September. So things are not getting worse in that sense. Um, in terms of net exports, I think that the dollar is likely to remain strong given what's going on in terms of the relative performance of different countries uh, and that net exports are going to continue to be a modest drag on the economy. Okay, so let me turn from here to uh, a few slides on the inflation outlook. This is a picture of uh, wage growth. Uh, the sort of key thing there is that wage growth appears to have leveled off. Uh, when we were looking at this series a year ago, you probably remember that we were seeing what we thought was a very welcome rise in pickup in, in wage growth. Um, that has that pickup has abated. I don't have a particularly satisfying story about why that pickup has abated, particularly when we're seeing some pickup in productivity growth. Uh, but I can see that we are seeing it, I can say that we are seeing it in a number of different series. Um, so given this kind of abatement of the pickup in wage growth and uh, stable inflation expectations, I really just have inflation creeping back to the Fed target. So uh, kind of remaining, that remaining a very mild story. Okay, so uh, turning to the Fed, uh, my baseline forecast assumes that the Fed is going to cut uh, one more time, 25 basis points in 2019. Uh, I think what's going on there is that they'll be balancing uh, the risks that are jeopardizing the expansion uh, against uh, what some committee members think are risks associated with uh, low rates. So, uh, so that's what my baseline outlook is. I should also note that I think they will resume some balance sheet growth at the next meeting uh, because of the recent term turbulence in funding markets. And I think we'll see kind of an announcement that's uh, saying, well, we'll let it grow to keep pace with demand for Fed liabilities. Um, so this has all been uh, kind of what I think is the most likely outcome for the U.S. economy. Um, I want to say a few words about risks. So uh, no doubt uh, recession risk has risen in the United States uh, as it has risen in other countries around the world. Uh, I put up a slide here showing the yield curve, um, the most commonly uh, kind of cited uh, recession indicator. And you can see it does have a strong correlation with recession, the low level, uh, you know, uh, looks like the low levels we've seen before prior recessions. Um, there's been a growing literature that's pointing out that the yield curve is, um, it's a warning signal. It's not a definitive indicator. There are 
a bunch of other things that have changed, and maybe relationships have also changed over time. Um, my reading of that literature is that the odds of a recession occurring in this country in the next 12 months have risen to something between 30 and 40 percent. So that would be kind of double what the normal probability would be in any given year. Okay, so elevated recession risks, but we shouldn't go out and panic. Um, and I think along those lines as well, we should not, I think the fears that we have no room to fight a recession are also overblown. So in terms of monetary policy, we have some limited room there. Um, we could reduce the policy rate. It's not at zero yet. That would, if we reduced it to the effective lower bound, that would deliver a cut that was only about a third as large as we've been able to do in past even relatively mild recessions. Um, we have some space in long to lower long-term uh, rates uh, and ease financial conditions more broadly through Q QE and forward guidance. Um, and the Fed could deploy modestly negative rates. I think they are unlikely to do so. And I should say, this is my opinion. You could talk to others at Peterson who are a little more bullish on this topic than I am. Um, what I do think is that the United States has considerable room to use fiscal policy to fight a downturn. So here, let me just like talk you through a, a, just a calculation in that regard. If you think about the stimulus that we put in place in early 2009 to fight the the last recession, uh, it was the initial score was something like $850 billion. Take that and double that, uh, just because we're a larger economy, uh, and uh, because it turned out that that package was not enough. I would say that's a that's a decent sized fiscal stimulus uh, when you consider the next that the next recession we'll face is likely to be more mild than the last one we we faced. But anyway, given the multiplier effect on the economy and the tax revenues associated with that, what you get in terms of a net cost would be a little over a trillion dollars for that package. Um, to put that number, it sounds like a big number, it is a big number, but to put it in context, it's really just a year's worth of federal borrowing. It really is just kind of ballpark, very similar to what the annual deficit is. So yes, it makes a debt to GDP uh, projections, it would make them worse, but by a limited amount. I mean, if you're thinking about there's, I mean, we should be worried about debt to GDP over the longer run, but if you're thinking about there's some date at which uh, kind of the, the debt to GDP becomes untenable, enacting this kind of fiscal stimulus would only pull that date forward by a year, and that would probably be kind of decades off. So yes, there is a trade-off, but in my opinion, to uh, uh, kind of fight off a recession, avoid uh, unpleasant things like hysteresis, I think it would be well worth it. So I think the fiscal space is there. I think the question is whether policymakers have the will to use it. OK, so that wraps up my remarks. I'm going to turn things over to John now. Let me start by saying how pleased I am to be to be back here. I was uh, invited several times to make presentations to report on research on elsewhere, but the uh, first time I'm visiting the Peterson Institute, and that uh, it's a great pleasure, as well as an intellectual excitement. So I'll follow up on uh, what uh, Karin said, focusing on on, on Europe. Uh, and let me start by showing this graph, which is um, the growth uh, of uh, the e EU, and which showed you that the slowdown that uh, you're seeing in, in the US came about a year earlier in Europe, uh, after having emerged slowly from the recession and having had a sort of mediocre growth, growth accelerated uh, uh, in uh, 17, but that was relatively short-lived. Uh, and uh, so now we're back to growth about a little bit above 1%, so a bit consistent with your, with your forecast. And the question is, obviously, why are we seeing that in Europe? And I would say we're seeing that uh, for a series of, of factors, some supply side, some demand side. An important one is that uh, net exports have stopped being a, a driver of, of growth. Uh, 
So here I'm comparing the, the, the growth period, the higher growth period of uh, 1917 with uh, the latest uh, quarters. And you see that a big difference is that uh, the, the export component has, uh, has virtually disappeared. Uh, we still have uh, consumer spending, we have some investment, but, um, but uh, the, the external driver has disappeared. Uh, why has this external driver disappeared? Here you have global trade volume. Uh, those are data compiled by the Dutch uh, Institute uh, for Economic Research. Uh, and uh, the, the, the vertical bar is the beginning of uh, uh, 18. And what you see here is that both for advanced economies and emerging economies, uh, the growth in trade volume has basically stalled uh, for more than a year. And that explains a lot of what's happening in countries like Germany, especially in Germany, because unlike the US, Germany is a very manufacturing economy. It's a very export-oriented economy. And the fact that the demand for uh, its, uh, its goods uh, in uh, emerging countries, in, in China, but also in the rest of the world, uh, does not grow anymore, has had a major impact on the on German growth. So that's one of the, of the reasons. Uh, th these are not the only reasons. I mean, uh, you, you have also had um, the fact that the European economy is returning uh, to potential after a period of, uh, of, of high growth that uh, the margin of slack is limited in some countries. Again, in Germany, it's, uh, it's limited. Um, you've had, uh, you also have the fact that there have been adverse supply shock. I'm thinking here of the, the automobile uh, industry, which is uh, suffering from uh, uh, shocks in the, the transition from one type of models to, to, to another. Uh, but also, uh, we're seeing um, domestically uh, made uh, shocks, I mean, European uh, shocks, and Brexit is ev evidently one of them. Um, here you have uh, the decomposition, uh, again, uh, the component of demands uh, for various countries. Uh, what you uh, see here is that the two countries hit by the external shock have been uh, uh, Germany and the UK. The UK, it's a bit particular, because the UK has been going through a series of uh, um, high instability hiccups related to Brexit. Before the planned date for Brexit, there was a lot of import, uh, precautionary imports, in anticipation of the disruptions created by No Deal uh, on uh, the 31st of March. Uh, and uh, immediate, so you had a negative uh, component of um, uh, of, of net exports. Uh, but immediately afterwards, obviously this corrected and you have this uh, high, 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 uh, I think it's here, yeah. It's here, you have this high instability created by, uh, by uh, Brexit and the uh, expectation of what can happen at different uh, dates with a substitution between inventory building and, uh, uh, and uh, imports. Uh, sorry, going back to here, uh, what you, you're seeing also is that um, the situation of this country is far from being uniform. You have two countries where growth is rather resilient, that's uh, Spain and France. Uh, Italy where it's flat, uh, and that's essentially homemade, uh, both because of a, of a, of a very uh, a poor uh, performance uh, over a 20-year period, but also the political shocks there have been in Italy uh, with the five-star uh, Lega uh, government. Uh, so, uh, quite a, uh, some difference. Now, um, <clears throat> turning to Brexit, it's hard to make a, a, a prediction about what can happen. Uh, it's highly, highly, highly politicized, and the latest news from this morning in fact, that politics is uh, taking precedence uh, with a blame game being played ahead of possible early election or a referendum. And so the likelihood of a deal uh, next week uh, with the, uh, between the UK and the heads of state and, and government has virtually uh, collapsed. Uh, 
Now, perhaps if we take a step, step back, we try to understand what's going on. Here on this map, I've tried to represent the various uh, the solutions uh, uh, to, the, to the problem. On the left side, you have uh, the uh, Theresa May's uh, um, solution, which was what she negotiated with the EU, uh, which has to, was to sort of move um, the uh, border uh, in part uh, between uh, Northern Ireland and, and, Southern, uh, and, and the Republic of Ireland and have so the, uh, the whole of the UK uh, being kept uh, within the customs union as a way to preserve um, the uh, relationship between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Um, and uh, also with some commitment to regulatory approximation. And then you would have had a border, but not a hard border between the Republican Ireland and, uh, and Northern Ireland. And what Boris Johnson has uh, 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 proposed is to sort of move, uh, not to speak anymore of, uh, of keeping uh, the UK inside the customs union, and so partly move to the border on the Sea of Ireland, that's for regulation, saying uh, the whole of the Irish island would be under the same regime for food and for, for uh, good regulation, and, and partly between the Republican Ireland and, and, and Northern Ireland. Now, is it possible to come to an arrangement, to an agreement with the EU? Under the present condition, it seems uh, rather unlikely. Uh, now, uh, in different political conditions, in which there would be more trust and in which there would be more stability on the side of the UK, that might be possible. Um, at any rate, uh, I think that the, the threat of a, a disorderly Brexit remains extremely high. The Bank of England recently updated uh, its scenarios. Uh, so there are partnership scenarios, and in partnership scenario, meaning a deal, uh, nothing essentially happens. All the costs have already uh, been, been, been borne. I mean, they're already in the, in the data. Now, the, the cost of a disorderly Brexit, they still put it at something like 6% for the uh, UK, 6% of GDP. So it's something really uh, very disruptive and very disruptive, especially in this type of situation where uh, weak growth is, is, is weak. Now, let me uh, move to uh, what would happen if the recession risk materializes. And here I want to echo and contrast uh, with what Karen said. First, on how much monetary space do we have uh, in the Eurozone? My answer is very, very, very little. Uh, essentially because if you look at the yield curve, here you have three yield curves. The yield curve five years ago, the yield curve one year ago, and the latest yield curve for uh, risk-free assets. So that means German bonds, if you wish. And the current yield curve is entirely in negative territory. The entirely including for 30 years bond. So this means that what remains uh, to uh, stimulate uh, the economy through monetary policy is really very limited. You're very close to the reversal rate. And on top of that, you, you do have some constraints. For example, on the buying on uh, bonds, of sovereign bonds, the ECB doesn't want to reach the threshold at which it would have to be, uh, to have a veto on restructuring. It wants to stay below this threshold. So that's uh, smart for, it's for investors to decide, it's not for the ECB to decide. Now it's getting very close to this threshold, uh, in, in, at this threshold for, for, for several countries. So that puts limit to what monetary policy can do. Now, what is the situation for fiscal policy? And here, uh, I wouldn't start from the numbers, I would start from the rules. Because the numbers compared to the US, you know, you would have on average more space than the US to, to stimulate. So that's not the way we should reason. Um, and the rules, uh, they, are, they, are, they are strict rules within the stability and growth path, but how much margin of maneuver we have. And so I just computed how much margin of maneuver there is within the rules. And the answer is there's a lot of margin for Germany and zero margin for the other big countries. Now, for Germany, it looks good because the margin of maneuver is about 2.6% of GDP, which is uh, uh, sort of uh, <laughs> significant. Uh, 
But uh, there are two uh, limitations. One is that Germany may not want to stimulate for the rest of the Eurozone. The other one is that Germany has its own limitations, and it ha actually has two. One is a very political uh, limitation, so that the ex-ante deficits that presented to Parliament must be zero at uh, most. That can be lifted. I mean, some voices have started arguing in favor of lifting it. But one, it's constitutional. And the constitutional uh, limitation is that the structural deficit shouldn't be larger than 0.35% of GDP, which is, which is very little. Now, there are buffers. There are margins of maneuver within that. There are ways around. But my message is that if you take all that into account, the scope for fiscal action uh, is limited in Europe. And that brings me to uh, the point that Adam was emphasizing, which is essentially, is, green, um, is the green transition a way around? Is it something that may deliver, in fact, a fiscal boost? Now, let me start by emphasizing that something has happened in Europe as regards the commitment to uh, decarbonization. Uh, the one commitment that's prominent in the declaration of the president of the new commission, Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, in her declarations, is really uh, the commitment to the climate transition. And that reflects a political reality, that the, the constituency for action is growing, and it's, ma it's a majority uh, um, among the, the, the young people. So there is a political incentive to move, although you know, obstacles are also considerable. I mean, once you start increasing the price of carbon, et cetera, on that, you know, they, people, people resent. And we saw that in my own country. But nevertheless, I think there is, there is a political momentum towards action. And so the commitment uh, now is total carbon neutrality by uh, 2050. That's endorsed by 24 countries out of, of 27, the exception being Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic which uh, evidently want to negotiate something, um, and uh, a reduction of emission by 50% by 2030 compared to 1990. All that represents, that's what I've put in the graph, a significant uh, acceleration of the, the pace of decarbonization. And that requires major investment that will require a major transformation in the way this economy functions. Now, even if part of that doesn't materialize. I think it's sufficiently prominent to uh, imply uh, something. So, which means we need to understand much better how the macroeconomics of this type of transformation works. And I think we have a lot to work to do to understand it better. It means also that there are bound to be uh, significant consequences for saving investment balances uh, of, of, of Europe. Uh, perhaps for, for what Mori is going to talk about, you know, the saving investment balance uh, globally, for fiscal policy, because the green transition can be an excuse, and a good excuse, actually, to go into debt, because from a purely fine public finance point of view, there are good reasons to say that you, you don't want necessarily to, to uh, ask the current generation to finance all of this uh, of tr transition. Uh, for trade, because... Um, Different countries going at different speed uh, towards uh, this, this decarbonization. There's all the question of the trade adjustment uh, and the possibility of a trade adjustment uh, tax, border adjustment tax. So I think that's something we, uh, we, we, we certainly must uh, work more and un understand better. Now, to conclude, is it going to deliver the fiscal boost? I don't know, because... Uh, Certainly, it may go in this direction. The question is, at what speed, uh, with what magnitude? Is it commensurate to the possible requirement of fighting a recession in a situation where monetary policy is not available? That's a big question, and I think it's a bit too early to answer. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. It's a pleasure to be here at Peterson. And uh, uh, I want to follow up these two wonderful presentations with um, 
Uh, something that's about U.S. monetary policy, but uh, of course U.S. monetary policy uh, affects the world and it is affected by the world, so there will be somewhat of a global focus here as well. Um, you know, to, to touch on the first point, um, Federal Reserve policy has always had a global dimension. Um, back in 1998, on September 4th, I had the privilege to um, attend a talk by Chairman Greenspan at the Haas School at Berkeley, and it was in the midst of the Asian crisis, and he made this statement. It is just not credible that the United States can remain an oasis of prosperity, unaffected by a world that is experiencing greatly increased stress. And shortly thereafter, the Fed cut interest rates in what is viewed as one of their past um, precautionary, precautionary cuts. Um, the Fed, as Karen mentioned, is, is expected to cut again uh, at least once this year. It's cut uh, twice this year already. And it's interesting to look at where it is compared to other advanced economies. So uh, this graph shows the... Um, 2019 forecast of real GDP on the horizontal axis from the uh, April World Economic Outlook. And a, a rough measure of the real policy rate, the policy rate minus 2019's forecast inflation rate. And as you can see, there's a remarkably strong positive relationship. Countries with higher growth rates tend to have higher real policy rates of interest. Um, Sweden, for reasons that are clear from looking at their recent developments is, is way below this line. Uh, the United States is actually um, above this line, as is, uh, as is Korea. So just judging from this sort of, of you know, relationship, um, you would say that the U.S. is sort of where, you know, it should be maybe a little tight after the latest, uh, the latest cut. Now, it's useful to um, look at these numbers in a in a uh, more theoretical framework, because really what what your your policy rate should depend on is not growth, but growth growth relative to potential, and that's where a uh, um, notion known as R star comes into the picture. So I want to start out by asking the question about why the Fed has been cutting interest rates. Why would Karen think that they are going to cut again in the future? Even though U.S. growth is projected to remain at or above potential for the next couple of years, and unemployment is historically low. Uh, when I wrote this sentence, it was 3.7%. Now it's 3.5%. But the sentence still, the question still applies. Um, modern, well, I, I was about to say modern monetary theory. That's not the best word to use. But um, <laughs> um, um, let me just say monetary theory. <laughs> Um, as it has developed in the last couple of decades uh, in the academic community, um, puts a lot of weight on Knut Wicksell's principle of price stability, which he per first put forward late in the 19th century. And the idea is that the real policy rate, which is the money rate of interest, the nominal rate of interest, less expected inflation, should be adjusted toward R star. And R star is the, uh, the so-called natural rate uh, the rate that would prevail in a hypothetical flexible price world with full employment. Um, if you uh, are too tight relative to this R star, you will experience deflation, too loose inflation. And this, this is actually a remarkably um, uh, ubiquitous principle in recent theoretical models, although, you know, as I said, it is in Wixell. You can even find hints of it in... Um, the book that Henry Thornton wrote in the first decade of the 19th century on the uh, the uh, paper credit of Great Britain. So it's 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 an idea that's quite time honored. Um, but if you if you if you look sort of below the hood, a prime determinant of our star is actually the rate of economic growth. Uh, and U.S. Growth, as I said, has been well above its estimated potential rate, which is about 1.8%. If you look at those estimates Karen had, they were for 2.3% this year, 1.8% next year. So basically, an economy that is uh, smoothly moving toward trend, soft landing, hopefully, why would you want to um, upset the, uh, the apple cord card? And aggregate employment is, is, is also very low. You definitely wouldn't want to... Uh, 
push that unemployment rate lower necessarily. Um, well, the, the, the answer that the Fed gives um, as they you know, defend themselves from, from criticisms that they're simply accommodating the administration is weaker bro gro growth abroad. And so is this something that really fits into this Wixellian framework? Is this something that makes sense? And I want to argue that um, it very much does make sense because in today's world of integrated financial markets, our, scar our star does not just depend on domestic growth. It's the result of borrowing and lending between countries, and it will reflect, in a very broad sense, a weighted average of growth rates, potential growth rates, throughout the world. So what is happening in Europe, for example, the, the uh, slowing factors that Jean has put out will be an issue. Uh, potentially what has been happening in China or Korea or Japan, uh, those will all be issues. So all the elements in Karen's forecast would come into, into play. Now, the U.S. trades less than other major economies, but it's still highly integrated with the rest of the world. There's a huge literature on measuring financial integration, and one um, very rough uh, de facto measure is just to look at the U.S. gross foreign assets and liabilities. Uh, liabilities have continued to rise since the financial crisis. They're at about 180% of GDP. Uh, assets have um, flattened out at about 140% of GDP. But these numbers still reflect substantial degrees of integration. Now, mind you, these are, these are far smaller than the numbers you would see for the UK. And those are smaller still than the numbers you would see for the, for the Netherlands. But still on the margin, it's fair to argue that the US is subject to international arbitrage and tightly integrated in financial markets, more so than in goods markets. So its real interest rate will depend on what happens abroad. And in fact, international arbitrage will uh, enforce um, a pretty tight relationship between U.S. and foreign uh, real rates of interest. Now, um, there's a lot of literature on this. There are things that come into play, such as the uh, um, risk premium on currencies, the um, liquidity premium on bonds of various kinds, the US reserve currency status, you name it. But as a very rough approximation, I think it's, it's useful to keep in mind a framework in which if the US real interest rate uh, rises above the foreign rate, if the real return on US assets is higher than what is available abroad, then the relative real value of dollar investments must be expected to fall through a real depreciation. Otherwise, money is going to move to the high interest rate country, uh, uh, and that will lead the exchange rate to change in such a way that this statement more or less holds. Now, again, we could have a whole debate about testing this relationship, but I think it's a very reasonable guide as a first approximation. Um, well, but what about real rates? I mean, one, one sort of very crude way of looking at this, or a very crude question you would ask is, well, if there are these tight links among real rates, do they tend to move together? And what this chart shows is that the answer is yes, they tend to trend together. There are sometimes big divergences, but over the longer term, the trend is in the same direction. And in fact, that trend is pretty definitively downward. Now, the fact that interest rates, uh, real interest rates, and these are long-term rates, not short-term rates, but the fact that they have reached these very low levels, uh, you know, as, as Jean indicated, some of the term structures are pretty flat at this point anyway. The fact that they've reached these very low levels is something that has a lot of implications for monetary policy. So let me um, just dwell on that for a moment. Um, why have real rates declined? Will they be low for a long time? Um, there are many analyses of this, but in light of what I have said so far, it won't be a surprise that I would want to tie this joint decline of real rates in industrial countries to uh, global, global factors, multiple, in fact, global causes. Um, 
Bernanke in 2005, in a very famous paper that I will come back to on the global saving glut, emphasized self-insurance by emerging markets. Uh, that has waned, but there are many other factors out there that we are coming to grips with. The demographics of slower population growth and longer lives that raise saving uh, throughout the world. Productivity growth has slowed. Um, you know, if Bob Gordon is right that we have, uh, you know, exhausted all of the, uh, the uh, major growth producing innovations that are out there to discover, then this could be a long haul. Uh, there's certainly been inadequate infrastructure investment in recent years in many countries. Uh, Germany is an outstanding example, and uh, its uh, inactivity in this area has contributed to the uh, rise of the euro area's current account surplus, which is a depressing factor on the global real interest rate. And finally, in a world with increasing policy uncertainty, with geopolitical risks, and I would also argue climate uncertainty, the demand for safe assets is, um, is higher than it would have been. So um, how does arbitrage work? How, do, how would these various factors come together to depress the global real interest rate? And also this, this R star, this Wixillian natural rate of interest. Um, this picture is a, a one that I've always found useful. It's actually the same picture that underlies the Bernanke speech. So if you go back and read that speech with this picture, next to you. I mean, the speech is incredibly clear. You don't even need the picture, but it will be a good way of sort of following along with his arguments. And here you can imagine that home is the United States, foreign is everyone else. Um, in both parts of the world, saving rises with the local real rate of interest. Uh, investment uh, falls as the local real rate of interest rises. And if these two parts of the world couldn't trade with each other, then saving would have to be equal to investment. And the natural real rate of interest, the one that brought these um, two, uh, two quantities together, saving investment, these two flows, uh, would be what I call the autarky rate of interest here. And that would also be the natural rate because this is basically a flexible price framework. And the way I've set it up here in the um, home country, the autarky rate is higher than in the foreign country. Um, if you let these countries trade with each other, and let me assume a purchasing power parity world, a world in which um, the relative price of national outputs can't change, uh, in which um, basically the exchange rate simply reflects relative inflation rates. In this world, the two um, uh, natural rates of interest which I label R sub H and R sub F, would have to be equal because arbitrage would keep them equal. Um, because the home country autarky rate is relatively high, uh, its equilibrium rate with an integrated world capital market would have to be lower. And that equilibrium rate ends up being between the two autarky rates. You can, you can see that it generates a deficit for the home country, which invests more than it saves in the equilibrium, and a surplus for the foreign country, which saves more than it invests in the equilibrium. And one way to state the equilibrium condition is that the home deficit equals the foreign surplus. And the diagram makes clear that that is the same as the statement that world saving equals world investment. OK, so this is basically um, what an equilibrium looks like. Um, now, as you can see, the, the, the equilibrium world rate uh, the R stars are, are determined by developments in both countries. Okay, it's not just the, the home rate of growth which will affect home investment and home saving that determines the equilibrium rate. It also depends on foreign uh, factors as well. Not only foreign growth, but foreign demographics, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, well, I'd like to look at the Bernanke experiment of an increase in foreign saving. Because one way to think about the current slowdown is to say, well, you know, investment is lower abroad or consumption is lower abroad. For whatever reason, uh, saving is higher abroad, and that is depressing growth abroad. You know, assuming that what we are looking at is primarily demand-side 
demand side factors. Now to make life a little harder, but also more realistic, I want to now introduce deviations from purchasing power parity. So um, this is what that picture would look like. Uh, Q here, if you look on the, uh, over there, the expected change in delta Q, okay? So Q itself is what I will define to be the real exchange rate, i.e. the price of foreign goods in terms of domestic goods. When Q goes up, domestic goods are relatively cheaper, foreign goods are relatively more expensive, and that is a real depreciation of um, the, home, the home currency. Um, the way I'd like to think about the dynamics here, and these are all in the background, is that when uh, foreign saving rises, and here I show a shift in the foreign savings curve to S prime of F, um, in the, in the sort of vanilla plain Bernanke story, global interest rates fall and are the same in both countries. In this world, when foreign saving rises, um, the foreign currency also depreciates in real terms, which is an appreciation for the home country in real terms. And with the usual sorts of overshooting dynamics that the data seem to imply, uh, what we would expect is that the home currency would appreciate a lot in the short run, but then be expected to depreciate further. And that leads to a wedge between the home and the foreign natural rates. And if you look at the chart here, you see that the foreign R star is below the home R star by the amount of this expected currency depreciation in real terms. So the, the message of this is that if foreign saves more, um, home's real natural rate will fall, not by as much as in the purchasing power parity world, but it will fall. And um, of course it will fall even more in the foreign country whose currency um, depreciates and is expected subsequently to appreciate. So this is my basic, you know, my basic uh, framework here. So what does this imply for monetary policy and for what the Fed should be doing? Um, why might the Fed cut in this situation? Now, in part, in the early 2000s, um, you know, as, as you will recall, uh, the U.S. response to the dot-com events was to um, cut the interest rate, even though those had not fully maybe spilled over to the U.S. And so the, the logic of the Bernanke argument is sort of the same as the argument I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give. Uh, the problem is that if the Fed does not cut low global demand, dollar appreciation, and deflationary pressures will emerge, which is how we define a slump. Now, as Karen indicated in her talk, you know, her expectation is that the dollar will remain strong but stable, and this is happening as the Fed has cut and is expected to cut interest rates. Without those cuts, the dollar would be stronger, and that would exert a deflationary force on the U.S. The US economy. Um, President Trump you know, intuitively understands this model, apparently. Um, so, um, you know, but joking aside, this is a very defensible position for the Fed to take. I think that, that global growth is relevant for the natural rate, and the Fed has to react to that. Now, looking longer term, this low R star is a challenge for monetary policy, uh, in part because it encounters with the effective lower bound uh, where a number of industrial countries already reside, they reside uh, you know, at negative rates, are going to be more, more frequent. But in contrast, um, there would be more fiscal space. So um, in light of the, the arguments Karen made about the U.S., you know, the cost of financing this extra 5% um, or so of GDP that might be needed to respond to a recession are quite low at, uh, at, uh, at current and expected rates of interest. Um, I would argue also that, you know, if the Congress were not completely paralyzed now, it would be wise, and in countries where there is scope, to uh, increase automatic stabilizers as inoculation against gridlock later on. Um, this would also go far to 
appease those who might worry about unsustainable fiscal policies because you're kind of committing yourself to tighten more in an upswing. And uh, Adam at the, at the start mentioned this uh, issue of monetary and fiscal coordination. Um, you know, I think, I think he's right that, that we really need to think creatively about sort of all the tools that are in the toolkit. Uh, recently, uh, 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 at Black, BlackRock, a paper was issued by uh, Jean Boivin, Stan Fisher, and Philip Hildebrand, uh, sketching out a framework uh, for monetary fiscal coordination. Um, I was in Europe shortly afterwards and found central bankers horrified that um, uh, these people could support this this idea, um, but you know, I, I think it's important not to fight the last war. And um, if we look out at our politics, think about the political implications of a really bad recession that policy fails to address, and what that will do to our institutions, which are already under pressure. And it seems to me that this goes far beyond the issue of central bank independence, that many other things could go by the wayside. Uh, so we should remember that central bank independence is a means and not an end in itself. Okay, some last thoughts on our star. Um, in 2010, the, the McKinsey Global Institute issued a report which now seems quaintly titled, and it was called Farewell to Cheap Capital. Um, and that seemed reasonable at the time. You know, clearly interest rates had been lowered sharply in the recession, but if you assume there would be a recovery, you return to normalcy, um, capital would not be so cheap forever. And in particular, they focused on the emerging markets where even in 2010, growth prospects seemed really, uh, really good for, for reasons, some related to China's stimulus and commodity prices, they were, they were booming. And real interest rates recovered uh, rather quickly. And um, if you look at this uh, picture, for which I thank Kristen Forbes for lending it to me, what you can see is that in, in emerging markets, real interest rates recovered and they have rem remained uh, persistently higher than in advanced, in advanced economies. Um, I think that in general, if we look at emerging markets, um, in addition to what is available in some advanced economies, there are big opportunities for infrastructure investment. And I very much want to come back to the theme that Jean raised about green infrastructure. Um, Nick Stern, among others, has um, argued very eloquently that there is currently a window in emerging markets as they build out their infrastructures to ensure that um, these infrastructures are green and interoperable with other green investments, that there's essentially a big push argument that if we, if we get this wrong in emerging markets and instead the wrong type of infrastructure is put in, um, we could be in big trouble. So I think this, this is a key point. Uh, it's a point about the availability of infrastructure investment and the importance that it be the right, the right, the right kind. Now, what prevents the high opportunities in emerging markets from uh, fully being reflected in our star as they should be in a world of global integration of capital markets is obstacles to capital flow. These are in markets and perhaps even more so in the institutions in these, uh, in these countries. So um, I would argue that addressing these uh, could lead not only to high, higher north-south flows, uh, but to higher global real interest rates and higher R stars in the advanced economies. But the need that, that this happen and that it happened in a thoughtful way that respects the, uh, the climate crisis indicates that this is really a, a, a uh, uh, legitimate area for global um, discussion uh, within the multilateral institutions. And I think that's the direction that these institutions have been pushing in the last couple of years. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Maury, Jean, and Karen. Uh, one small factual correction that uh, 
already famous, if not infamous, BlackRock report had a fourth co-author, Elga Barch, as well as the three listed. Um, so uh, we are on the record. Uh, we have three very exciting and I think important presentations already in your minds and in the can, but it can go into very interesting directions depending on what your questions are. As always at the Peterson Institute Public Events, we have a roving mic up front, held in this case by Jessica. We have a standing mic in the middle. Uh, please feel free to indicate where you want to go. Um, if I recognize you for a question, please at least pretend it's a question, not a statement, and please identify yourself when asking the question. Thank you. Uh, who would like to go first? Please. Um, Mary Lovely from the Institute. I have a question about China. None of you, I think, mentioned China, and yet it seems a lot of the excess saving is in China. And we're now facing prospect where there could be uh, bifurcation between Western capital markets and Chinese capital markets, perhaps. I wonder if you can talk about that, if it factors into these uh, forecasts and possibly risk. Thank you. Maury, do you want to, you used to have to deal with stuff like that at the fund. Do you want to take a shot? Um, yeah, you know, um, push the button. Okay, cool. Now, clearly, China was a was a, a key player in the Bernanke um, account of the world, and so uh, Chinese saving is uh, part of part of the story of Low R Star. Though, though, it's it's you know. Certainly, if you look at, at the global imbalances as we have analyzed them at the past at the fund, you know the locus of those has moved away from China and toward, you know, advanced economies. You know, bigger surplus overall in in Europe, bigger deficit in the in the United States. So clearly, in this integrated world, China is uh, is 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 part of the story. But but I wouldn't say it's playing a huge role. Um, uh, comparable to what it was, uh, the role it was playing, perhaps in the in the two thousands. And you know, I have my differences with Ben's interpretation of 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 the world from that period. Also, I won't go into those. Um, you know, de decoupling. Uh, uh, you know, I would say with with China as close as it is to current account balance, I don't think decoupling would would have a huge effect on global interest rates. Uh, I would worry more about the. Um, the disruption caused by the, um, you know, so, sort of chain of political events and repercussions that 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 would lead to more more decoupling, and how that would affect affect global growth. I think that that's sort of the first order set of things we should worry about. So, yeah, I think it's critical that the the you know the U.S. and China find a more constructive way to. Um, settle their their differences um, than than to um, you know have the US pretend that they care about Uyghurs and have China you know ban NBA games and you know um, there's there, there's certainly scope to um, uh, to uh, adopt a better strategy and of course you know the US is not the only advanced countries that has beefs with China's China's policies so you know there's a, I think there's a big big opportunity to um, for a win-win here that is being uh, is being bypassed, and the the cost of that could be very disruptive events in the world economy. Just to um, Mary, you you were very strong on TV, I think, yesterday about the folly of the uh, self-defeating policies out of the Navarro Policy Shop Mark III. Um, so let me just reemphasize something Maury said. As we at Peterson and most of the economics profession keeps reminding people, including the Trump administration, bilateral deficits don't matter. What matters are global imbalances. And as it is not an accident that Maury referred to specifically Germany in his talk and his examples, and, and also Jean referred to it in terms of his Europe agenda, because the specific oversaving and lack of public investment in Germany is having global repercussions. As Maury said, while the Chinese behavior may affect 
various specific sectors and industries, as long as they're in relatively close to capital account balance, their impact on the overall world in that sense is not very large. The second point is just, we, we, there are a lot of arguments for why you don't want capital sloshing around the world in various ways. But permanently interfering with diversification or lastingly interfering with diversification of people is going to have destructive effects of creating these weird divergences in interest rates. And that is what's going to cause turmoil in a fundamental sense, even before we get to the political consequences that Maury rightly raises. Sorry, that's the hand-waving version. There and then over here. And by the way, people not from the Peterson Institute are allowed to ask questions too. Uh, Jacob Kierkegaard from the Peterson Institute. Now it's a question for Sean, but really for the whole panel. I mean, one of the themes of all of the, um, all of the, um, remarks, or at least the two first ones, was the uh, trade, the collapse in trade and the macro, negative macro implications from, uh, for the, uh, from that uh, uh, development. But at the same time, there was at the end this call for green growth, which I, by the way, fully support. But isn't it, I mean, and you mentioned it, Sean, I mean, uh, if you're going to have serious carbon pricing and quite frankly, also the political economy of serious green fiscal stimulus, it means uh, that you're going to have a similarly uh, serious carbon adjustment, border tax, whatever you want to call it. So I'm wondering if you could address uh, the, as I see it, pretty clear trade-off uh, there. I mean, if you want more public or private investments in green stuff, you're going to have continued negative macro implications from the trade front. Sean? I, I would Press the button, please. Oh, I see the risk. But I wouldn't put it this way. Uh, you know, climate can affect trade first for two reasons. One is that the uh, relative uh, price of uh, goods imported uh, with the carbon content of, of transportation may rise, which may affect trade. The other one is through these uh, carbon uh, border adjustment taxes. But if properly designed, the carbon border adjustment taxes are not distortionary. I mean, they, they, they would just correct a distortion resulting from the fact that the resource is priced in some countries, not priced in other countries. And whereas it's a global resource, so it should be priced in the same way in the first best, it would be priced in the same way globally. Now, it's true that it could be used, and it will be certainly used, uh, as, a, as an excuse for protectionism. So this requires vigilance, it requires international coordination, it requires a lot of things that are in short supply these days. But uh, we shouldn't confuse the fact that it may be mismanaged with the fact that it is uh, uh, fundamentally detrimental to, to global integration and trade. It's not. Um, Jacob, two other points. I mean, first is, as you'll recall, Nearly two years ago, we did a big effort here when the initial Trump administration tried to do a border tax. And one of our results from our research consistent with others was it would be an extremely disruptive transition. And the issue was that the US wasn't going to get anything for it. If we're getting decarbonization, which I know you agree with, but just to be clear, even in public investment terms, you're getting something for it. But the second thing, which goes to a paper, Joe, was it you and Caroline who, who did the paper? Yeah, uh, on the exchange rate, or was it Bill? Um, the exchange rate, I apologize for my poor memory, the exchange rate impact of a border adjustment tax. And usually what would, you would see happening is the country or the region putting on the tax would also see an exchange rate appreciation to offset it. So if we live in a world where that something approximating that happens, and in this case it's Europe that has the appreciation, that's not entirely self-correcting, but it gets you part of the way. Um, over here, please. I'm glad to, as Ted Truman from the Peterson Institute, but I'm glad to defer to someone else. I think that Maury Obsfeld wins the award for the most uh, technical presentation that has been given at one of these things. I will call it the Mike Musso Award. 
uh, running us through our in introductory macroeconomics. Uh, so my question is, goes back to your first proposition that uh, that uh, the low R star is a function of declining uh, 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 real natural rates of growth uh, and underlying natural rates of growth from above, from the advanced countries, right? So we're declining that way. But is that, it, would you agree with that? So that we're in some sense above the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, potential rate of growth? Uh, and is that true for the world as a whole, right? Because a lot of what your argument rests on uh, is that, it, that you, you're a, actually in equilibrium, but uh, the, the short run dynamics that, that Karen is looking at was, uh, was, uh, would be slightly different, it seems to me, in that context. Yeah, if I, if I understand the question, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think the, I mean, like it seems to me that the, the global growth rates we're looking at for the next couple of years are somewhat below global, global potential. Um, you know, Karen was forecasting 3.3. I think the fund is a 3.2 and the OECD is lower. So, you know, depending, depending where you, where you were, are, but, but, you know, global potential, I think, is at least at least 3.5. So, you know, I think there's a case that, that there is a strong case for, for, for monetary stimulus. Now, that's going to mean realistically that, the, you know, the U.S. real rate is, is probably somewhat, somewhat above um, what it is in, in the rest of the world. But I think that still leaves a case as the bad news has accumulated for the Fed to to cut, and it's you know we, we, we don't estimate our star with any with any precision, but but you know sort of one of the one of the notable things about the literature, uh, most of the literature at least, is that people tend to estimate it on a country by country basis. So if you look, for example, at the um, Holston Laubach Williams stuff, I'm sorry to get technical again, but it's you know it's all done. You know you estimate the German R star, you estimate the UK R star, you estimate the US R star, and the fact that these things have any relationship to each other is never part of the estimation strategy. Now it turns out that they move together because all the variables that they are based on move together because markets are so integrated, but. Um, you know, this is sort of this is sort of a problem, I think, with the literature. And uh, you know, if you if you do sort of something global that's based on global growth, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get a lower lower R star, I think, for the U.S. than you would get out of these, you know, closed economy estimates. Karen, do you have anything you want to add on terms of this bridging between the short term and the medium term? Or obviously, you have expertise on Fed policy as well. How do you think the Fed should be taking into account the global outlook? Um, the, the, can you just the bridging between the short term and the medium term? Yeah. So, uh, Sorry, because I thought what Ted was raising was the idea that the short term dynamics would be somewhat different than what Maury was concerned about in, in your forecast. Anyway, don't worry about my question. Do you have anything <laughs> you want to say in terms of this international effect, in terms of what you think Fed policy should be in, in terms of your forecast? Ignore I, me. <laughs> I, I, I will say I, I, I have uh, largely agree with what uh, Maury is saying that, and I, I mean, the, the way I've uh, thought about it is that as the kind of global rate uh, falls or the global neutral rate falls that uh, unless we uh, lower our rate, then we're effectively tightening. So that's all. I will leave it there. That was clear. Uh, yeah. Monica DeBull, um here from the Peterson Institute as well. I wanted to come back on the points about green growth and, um, and, and what we are saying, um, which I absolutely support, strongly support at that, and the issue of macroeconomics and, and environmental policies. We've talked about that a bit, um, and I think both Maury's remarks and Jean's remarks were excellent on, on point. But we have kind of skirted the political economy problems. And just looking at one region of the world specifically, I know France obviously has had issues with this, but in Latin America where fuel um, subsidies are widespread amongst countries, we just saw 
in Ecuador, we're seeing actually in Ecuador, a huge political fallout from the removal of fuel subsidies um, recently done by the, by the government. So I wonder you know, what your thoughts are on the political economy obstacles to implementing some of these ideas. Thank you. John is, and, and, and Maury, but John, you've had yellow vests in your face, so why don't you yes, go first? Yes, exactly. Political economy is, a, is, is awful because, uh, I mean, these policies create losers. They create losers among people who have little uh, options, uh, you know, to protect themselves from it. And the lesson from the yellow vest is that uh, it, uh, it hit people who were dependent uh, because of where they lived and the, uh, the fact that they're using the, they were using their car to go to work, etc., and had uh, no short-term alternatives. So they felt that it was simply a way to take money out of, of them. So the, I think the idea of climate, uh, of carbon dividends, on the, in principle, is a, is a good idea. That's in, in, in fact, this is not a resource. The first thing to say, and it doesn't apply to subsidies, obviously. But I mean, the carbon tax is not a resource you can use elsewhere. It, should, it has to be uh, used to compensate the losers. Carbon dividends is a rough approximation. Then you can refine the way you're going to compensate the losers. But you cannot use it to lower the, 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 the cost of labor or to do whatever uh, else. I mean, you, you have to consider that uh, at the very least, this is what you should be doing. Now, even even with that, I mean, you know, when you do the calculation on a detailed basis, you find that you can most probably compensate half of the bottom half of the population so that the bottom half of the population in terms of income does not suffer from this, this transition. Now, there will be still, you know, people uh, being hurt, uh, industries being hurt, and the political economy is going to be very difficult. More? Well, Jean basically said everything I was going to say, so I, I was just underline two points. One is that you mentioned subsidies, and we shouldn't forget that, that carbon pricing also involves the appropriate subsidies. So subsidies for you know, agricultural products that intensively take carbon out of the atmosphere is sort of a good idea, and that's not something that's going to cause, it may cause budgetary issues, but not necessarily political economy issues. Again, in the low interest rate world, maybe you know, we, should, we should definitely be making those investments. The other aspect, the political economy aspect that I think is incredibly important is the, um, the, in, the international aspect and the, in, uh, the point about international externalities and um, you know, who pays. So you know, take Brazil as an example. Um, you know, there may be reasons in terms of economic development for Brazil to cut down part of the Amazon forest and you know, produce more soybeans to send to China. But, um, you know, if one is realistically going to ask countries to um, uh, abstain from these activities, you know, you need to either get them to impose taxes or make transfers to them. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, at some level, there's a huge problem of multilateral cooperation and uh, side payments that we would we sort of need to solve here to really fully address the problem. And I'm not really sure how how that happens in this environment. Cool. There. Uh, Bill Klein from the, the Institute. Jean and, and Maury, uh, I got the impression you thought, uh, you know, green investments could be somehow used as counter cyclical mechanisms. Maybe you didn't mean to say that, but the, 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 the lore circa you know, 10 years ago, was it fiscal is not the way you deal with recessions. It takes too long. Uh, now, in the face of the lower bound on monetary, I was looking for fiscal that is responsive. But I would have thought that a plan of investment to bring that curve down to zero that, that Jean had was sort of prototypical long-term strategy and would not lend itself very well to... Uh, Filling, filling the role of uh, that monetary can't fill in a, in a, in a cyclical situation. Any of you care to? Um, 
I think it's Adam who was the strongest by oh, make, making, okay. making so the link between, now we're into blame between shifting, the fiscal, like fiscal policy and climate. No, I, I very much agree it's a long-term endeavor. Um, it, it certainly has implications for the Air Star. I mean, that, uh, you know, that may be because of the, uh, the change in the level of investment it may Im imply. Now, the fiscal implication, I would see it as a sort of you know, the possibility of justifying action that would otherwise right. not be acceptable. You may know that in the Netherlands, they're considering uh, creating um, uh, the, 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 the coalition. The government coalition is, is considering revising the fiscal pact that's at uh, the root of this current coalition to introduce a possibility of creating a green fund that would borrow on the market and invest in the transition. If it's done you know, within the time frame of the current coalition, it may have, it will have uh, macro implications. So I'm not saying that the time frame is the same, but I'm saying there is, there are some connections. I, I just want to jump in. Uh, I mean, I would, I would do both. I mean, I think there is scope for some infrastructure uh, spending to be effective as stimulus, but um, you know, interest rates are so low right now. Uh, I think you could have counter cyclical stimulus of other forms. Uh, but you should also be doing kind of the longer term investment as well. Um, and just on the longer term issue, I just want a quick response to Monica, which is I think kind of the right kind of green infrastructure could pay social dividends over the longer run. And you know, if you're talking about kind of good public transportation to get to enable people to get to the good jobs, I think while I agree with my colleagues and with you about the short-term political difficulties, I think there could be a long-term benefit in terms of social cohesion and alleviating uh, hardship. Bill, um, as blame shifts, let me um, go one step further than my colleagues as was implied at the start. Um, the first point is just building on John. As a matter of forecasting, my, main, my initial point was as a matter of forecasting. If you look at where the Dutch government has moved in the last year, if you look at various other governments in Europe, if you look in particular how almost everybody who matters in Germany, not the final people, but a huge number of people, including former finance minister Schäuble, have publicly shifted position on the need for greater public investment, the delta we are likely to get in the next year or two is going to be towards stimulus, and the environment we're likely to have in the next year or two is probably going to be flat or downside. So in that sense, it is an opportunity politically for those of us who care about the long-term investment of decarbonization, and it may get sold, again, as Jean was saying, as Karen was saying, it may get sold in part as stimulus. I think a German recession or a German manufacturing recession, and Jacob has made a similar point, gives more impetus to this effort, especially if the ECB can't do anything for them. The second point, though, I would make, and this is something which you have thought through in various ways yourself, Bill, and which we need to decide on, but picking up on some of the comments about this tangled web of distributional impacts of subsidies, pre-existing subsidies for energy, and various other factors, one can imagine a sequencing issue where one is up front invest spending on investment, public investment, but also goodies to buy out people who have stranded assets, goodies to buy out people who are currently subsidized. So there's stimulus at the front end and then introducing the carbon pricing and the taxing more aggressively at the back end, which might, if we play it right, be broadly in line with the cycle we're talking about. Again, this is not a pure theory thing. This is not something that absolutely has to happen. But this is the kind of direction I was having in mind when we're talking about practical steps going forward. The final point, and this is intellectually above my pay grade, but there are people, and John would know well, but I mean, I think Philippe Aguillon, for example, has made an argument about a similar sequencing issue that you want to be 
subsidizing various green technologies to give people alternatives to switch into before you go full bore on the taxation. And so that, again, could get you this idea that there's more stimulus up front versus in back, even taking fully your point that if we're serious about decarbonization, this is a multi-year commitment. Anybody else, even those not from Peterson, although I love it here, but, well, joking aside, I think this has been a very rich discussion. It gives you a sense of where the world economy is going. It gives you a sense of where particularly the U.S. economy is going. It gives you a sense of where we think things should be going as well and some of the things we're going to be working on. Thank you all for joining us, and please join me in thanking Karen Dine and Jean-Pierre and Maurice Holtzman. <laughs>